Hello, I'm Doug Carter from, from beautiful St. Catharines, uh, originally from Scarborough, Ontario, and uh, I'm now the director of tennis and uh, past owner of Niagara Academy of Tennis in Vineland, Ontario. And I'm Willie Maninga. Um, I'm originally born in Montreal, Quebec, and for most of my life I've actually lived in Ottawa. Ottawa would be the place that I call my hometown. Um, and I've been here in Niagara for the last five years, ever since I've been hired as the head coach of the men's basketball team here at Brock University. You know, I'm lucky that, that I had role, monitor, role, role monitors, um, role models and, and, um, and mentors all the way through, from teenage life to, to even now. And as a teenager, I distinctly remembered a gentleman, uh, Bill Knowles, who, who gave his time as a volunteer to me and said, you know, Doug, I want you to go into this path uh, by what he did. He wasn't a professional, but he really wanted to do that. And then I got into my late teens. Um, I had another mentor, uh, Paul Clark, who was absolutely wonderful as well. And, and I, I followed him. He didn't say I wanted to be your mentor, but I followed him, and that was lovely. I was fortunate to come to Brock in the mid-70s. Um, and uh, one of the professors, Dr. David Staniford, uh, took me under his wing and he was my mentor. He was obviously a tennis player, and that's why I carried on. Uh, it's funny, I wanted to come and play basketball, actually, and, and so <laughs> forth, but, uh, but the skill level, uh, my level, was not strong enough. But um, I'd had so much of tennis that I thought, maybe it's time to put the racket down and try other things. And, um, but he convinced me to do that, and it made a big difference in my life. So those were my uh, teenage and university mentors. And then when I graduated, you know, do I go this way or do I go that way? Our program was, was recreation or, or education. Right. And I said, well, first year, let me try recreation, you know, because I've been involved in sport for so long. And, and I went into recreation in Toronto and a gentleman named Gus Villanueva, who was the senior director at the time in tennis, just blew me away and said, this is what I want to do. And here we are some 45 years later, wow. still doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how that works. Yeah. Eh? You start doing something a long time ago and yeah. then it just transitioned. Yeah. Like for, for me, it's funny hearing you speak and I think about who are my role models. And a lot of times role models are mentors. And a lot of times your role models and mentors, it's not like, hey, hey you're my mentor and I, please, I want you to teach me. It just happens through a, rela a relationship over time. And for me, when I think about it, it's just even sitting here, I think my first role model was my father. And my father passed away in 2009, um, struggled with a lot of health issues, but he was the first man in my life that I could remember just, I think about who I am now as a coach, who I am as a person and everything that I am despite a tumultuous relationship with my father growing up, I am a spitting image of him in terms of my personality and how I carry myself in terms of how I want to be held yeah. accountable. But he was the first person, he was into sports, he was a big soccer player. I didn't follow in his footsteps in terms of playing soccer, but I was obsessed about sports like he was obsessed about sports. So for me then, my love for basketball became just from growing up in an era where Michael Jordan was the talk of the town, right? And everyone wanted to be like Mike. And I just started playing basketball in my neighborhood where I was growing up. And then when I went to high school, my f next role model, who now is still a mentor till this day, and I would argue my best friend, um, Osvaldo Janti, who is also responsible and a part of the dynasty that Carleton University has created in our sport in this country. He was one of the first, he was the first to win a championship for that university and then he won five in a row and since then they've won more than I care to mention yeah. <laughs> on, this, uh, on this platform. But he would have been the next guy that I kind of looked up to because I wanted to be like him. He was great in high school as a basketball player. Then he went on to university while I was still in high school. He was my older brother's best friend. Um, and when I was in high school watching him in university dominate, it just made me want to be in more like him. And I actually ended up going to Ottawa U simply because I wanted to compete against him as opposed to joining him at Carleton. Um, but no, it's just funny, your, your mentors and your role models just come from relationships. I can think of another uh, mentor of mine who's a head coach at Ottawa U. He would have been my club coach growing up in high school in grade 10. So having him in grade 10, 11, and 12 and being around him, we 
built a relationship and he was going into the coaching world and he was the first person that ever told me as a 17 year old hey I think you have a future in coaching one day because they were getting ready at Ottawa U to go to a national championship run and I was in the office because we had practice that evening so I used to go in the office while he watched film to just do my schoolwork before we headed to practice and as any passionate basketball mind would do he was watching film so instead of doing my schoolwork, I was watching what he was watching and I, I ended up having a few suggestions that he was surprised that I had and that's when that conversation happens and till this day he's a close friend of mine in the business obviously we compete against each other now but it's fun because I've been at his wedding and whatever the case may be but those would be some of the guys I think about as role models that growing up and it's just funny how it, that happens. It, it's not something that you go and you select. It just happens naturally, I find. I come from a country in South America named Guyana, originally British Guyana. And, and it's a Commonwealth country. And it's a country that's made up of, you know, 30, 40 percent African, 30 percent uh, South Asian and ethnicity. And they're always butting heads. So my mother, who's 50 um, percent Chinese and 50 percent African, you know, rolls around in, in, in the mid 20s, and she met she meets this guy in in, in the um, in the 30s, my father, uh, who's African, um, and they hit it off really well, and she became a senior uh, national champion in Guyana, and as of a person of color, it was quite an outstanding thing because back in those years, back in the 40s and so forth, uh, uh, early 50s. Um, it was still very dominated by the, by the British um, thinking. And so that was quite a unique moment. So it, I should have said role model originally, but she certainly is a big, is a big, a big character in, in, in who, and that's what brought me to it. And aren't all mothers? If you're, especially if you're yeah. fortunate to grow yeah. up with one. I know yeah. we talk about role models, but my mom is definitely one of those for me as well, just in the way that I now raise my kids and the care that I want to provide for them and also the partner that I want to be to my fiance. But um, I don't know if you're asking me the same question, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, for, for me, like I said, man, I grew up in the era that's not as deep as yours, mm -hmm. but... Michael Jordan had an impact on society in the mid 90s that I think only Tiger Woods could rival in a different landscape when we talk about sports and their effect to change the way that people wanted to just play a sport or just commit to it and I've always been super competitive and a lot of my friends would say also very annoying so then I just dove right into the sport and I've been obsessed ever since and I wish that I could speak about it in a different way but it's just that simple I just became very obsessed I still am I'm still very passionate and very competitive and anyone that has been around me I think would agree and feel that energy off of me and I've just hit the ground running I, I one of my favorite stories about just kind of just basketball getting into it and staying in it is I speak of my mother she's a nurse and my whole life she wanted me to convert and be a nurse. She couldn't understand what I was doing with basketball. It wasn't until one day I was packing my U-Haul and I called her on my way here to Brock. And I said, hey, I'm on my way to Brock, just uh, to my apartment. I just wanted to let you know I'm hitting the road. It was the first time she said, wow, you actually made something out of basketball. <laughs> and I, said, I laughed, I said, mom, I told you I would. And just because I just, I've always just had my head down and just whenever that round ball came into my hand the first time and I started playing in my neighborhood I just it's just been life it, it really it really has been and through that other parts of life have been added but that has been kind of the common ground that has brought me and kind of shaped me and molded me to who I am today it, again I, I mentioned earlier that you have these ethnicities which are butting heads and, and, and I know there's a, a, we have a theme today, and, and, and sometimes it could be challenging in either way. It could be a very positive one or a very challenging one. My story is very positive in terms of that, and I, hopefully we can speak of that uh, later on. But because the country was such in turmoil, as many of these small countries tend to be back in, in, in the 60s, we came over in 64, um, that my parents, who were the educated middle class, yep. a visible minority, you know, my mother is 
Chinese, but looks African, and, and my dad's African. And they said, you know, where do we go? You know, where do we go? The U.S. at that time, no, no. Even though, and our spoken word is, is English. And, and so uh, I wish I had French, because uh, one of the other Guyanas is French Guyana yeah, yeah. and Dutch Guyana, as you might know. And uh, so our language was English. And, and so it was either U.S. was challenging, Canada was a Commonwealth country. This is the long answer. <laughs> and, and Europe was languages, and it just wasn't there. Um, so my parents said, let's go to Canada. And we ended up in a, a, little, a little wee... That's a whole story. But anyway, we ended up in Scarborough, and it worked out lovely. It was, very, it was a very positive thing. So we came because, specifically, uh, there was welcoming. It was, a, it was a Commonwealth country, and there was strife in the country we were from. And our parents felt for their two sons, who were 7 and 12, this is not the environment that uh, we want to, to raise them in. And in those years, the educated middle class, particularly if you're of African descent, who was the party of power coming in, they didn't want us to leave. They didn't want my dad to leave. You know, did not want them to leave at all because you're the heart of what this country is going to be. Yeah. And, and, and you're leaving, you know, so it wasn't well received. Um, but my parents felt so strongly about that, that we're going to give up everything to exaggerate a little bit and come. Yeah. But they got jobs right off the bat. Uh, the kids worked out okay, so it was very successful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think my parents would have a similar story. Um, my dad was a very well-educated man and a very, like, academics for my father are of huge significance. That's a man that held many bachelor's degrees. And when he was in Haiti, uh, I'm of Haitian descent, uh, both my parents were born in Haiti, so when they got together, my dad decided to uproot and to come to Canada at the time, Montreal, and again, very similar to you, it was the States or or Canada and we had family already in New York City most of my family outside of Haiti all reside in New York City or in, in New York State at this point they've kind of um, expanded a little bit but yeah they just dropped everything to give themselves an opportunity not even necessarily give themselves an opportunity to give our now their kids an opportunity at having success and more opportunities in life and just a a fresh start because anybody that knows anything about Haiti the country is in turmoil like I, I know some of my high school friends whose parents would have gone to Haiti for um, their honeymoon where now most people wouldn't visit Haiti because it's um, there's just, just a lot of crime and a lot of uh, political issues that surround Haiti so my parents having that almost foreshadowing kind of where the country was headed they they left and again I talk about my dad my dad was a soccer player that they wanted him to play for the national team um, he was an accountant so he could provide like you said resources and benefits to Haiti to help the country but he packed up and came here on the only difference is unfortunately for my father when he came here none of his degrees qualified him to work in yeah. the business well, that we he were very fortunate that yeah way. he he yeah. wasn't as fortunate so he he actually became a uh, pastry chef okay. so that was one of his uh, neat little things he still has all his recipes yeah. <laughs> yeah my dad has all his recipe books uh, I cannot bake a cake to save my life I never took up on it but no, that, that's, that's our story and my story and kind of how we, my family, immigrated to Canada. I'm lucky I was born here and I'm a proud, obviously, Canadian citizen. Uh, but it, I definitely understand where I come from and how I got to this place today. When I was 40 several years ago, and that's when they came over, uh, I couldn't imagine me at 40 leaving Canada to go to another country to, to, to do things. I can't imagine it. So I'm, I'm very proud of my parents for making that. Um, and Guyana needed them to stay, as Haiti, I'm sure, needed yeah. them to stay. But I can see my dad had seven other siblings, and they all stayed. Yeah. So they did their, they did their thing. But um, I think it was very positive for us. Hey, yes. it's a sacrifice. Like, as a former professional athlete, yeah. just to leave your home and to go somewhere else just simply for a year, and you're getting paid, everything is guaranteed. They tell you where you're gonna live, you have a car, you have all of these things. There are no, there's nothing that you can't plan or have a thought of how it's gonna go when you leave to go play professionally somewhere in Europe, for example. 
but to pack up and to just say, we're just taking everything we own and everything we know and we're going to land in this place and hopefully things go well. That takes a lot of, a lot so. of courage, I a lot so. of courage, right? So I'm not sure I would have had that uh, much courage, I, but anyway. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I would either, to be honest. <laughs> you know, I knew this question was coming and, and I did think of it and, and, and I, I did not. You did not. <laughs> I did think, no, I did think of it because I want it to be true in, in, in the response to that, you know, and, and, and as you heard, I came from a country that had these tremendous butting of heads, and, and, and I didn't grow up in that because I came to Canada at Scarborough when I was seven, so I didn't know of that. And, and my parents were quiet people, you know, uh, my mother was this and dad was a very quiet man. He was a track athlete, so he, they, they're both very athletic and, and, and very important part of the country as well, particularly uh, on my dad's side. And, but if he has to hear another tennis story, he will die, you know. So anyway, but that's that. So in Scarborough in, in the 60s, okay, in the 70s, most of Toronto really were of European and, and, and UK um, people, if, okay, ethnicities. And so when I show up with some of the other Guyanese, you know, I'm a token person here. But I was only seven, you know, going on that, and I didn't realize that at the time. And, but I could look around, and I can see, okay, you know. So in my opinion, my, we are who our parents were, and they were a very quiet family for the most part. So I didn't mind being at the back of the room because I didn't want to be in the forefront because of how I perhaps look like, even though I didn't, even though I didn't, that wasn't the case perhaps. So I always sat in the background. And that's easy to do in a classroom of 20, 30 people. Um, however, one of the good things is that genetically, I had this sport background. I had the gene, yeah. you know, and they clunk you into all these, these sporting things. And I was very fortunate to be the front runner with those things in, the, in that environment. So here I am, a guy who wants to be in the back, but because of my, 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 my sport, I'm always thrust into the front. And so I was lucky through those years, I think because of that, because of that success in the sport environment, which I didn't do it for the sake of that. It just, it was, it was the gene pool, thanks mom and dad, and, and I was put out there. So I created, I was lucky to have respect within uh, a majority environment because of that. Okay, so that's, I wanted to get that message very clear. Um, I didn't want to be in the front, but because of my sport, I was always in the front. And, and I, I was fortunate to have um, respect from the majority in that. So when we push forward now into the teen years, um, you know, a little bit more immigrations coming to, to Scarborough, uh, particularly from the Caribbean and so forth. And so, you know, you're seeing a little bit more. And, 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 and so then I think tensions are growing a little bit. And I could only think of one instance on the football field where uh, a majority individual was, was critical of, of, of what I did, specifically. And I didn't think I did anything wrong. I think I may have done something well, and they were critical because of that. And I distinctly remember my teammates, who were not of the majority, were very supportive of me. And, and I was very, uh, that, really, that really got me. You know, and I thought that was very important to see that. So now we jump into the, into, into the mid-70s, and now we're at Brock, you know, or in athletics. And in those years, we were very young. We were very early, you know, I was at McDonald House and on residence, and, and it was really kind of cool to be there. And, and there still was not a strong multiculturalism in, in, our, in, our, in our area. So I, I wasn't under that tension right. of, of that. You know, again, I'm speaking as a, I'm going to be 68 this year. So in those years, it was different, you know. Um, but I will share a little story. So my brother still lives in the area that we grew up in. And, and um, so his children, I went to a school, a high school, that was not very multicultural at all, okay. It was all majority. And, and, and but his children, so we skip a generation now, they didn't want to go to that school because of that. They wanted to go to Cedarbury because that was very multicultural. And I was, I was very proud of my particular high school because we, we made a lot of accomplishments and were great people there. And I was a little bit, I couldn't understand at the time. This, they're now 40, so this was some 25 years ago. Um, they're in their 40s now, some 25 years ago. I, why didn't you want to go to, to Mowat? You know, it was, it was a great, it was really wonderful for me. 
And, uh, but then they, they start raising, so the, it started becoming far more prevalent in, in my world. And uh, so I, that, that really caught me, you know, from that standpoint. Uh, if you want to jump into adulthood and some forth, well, in the 80s, I show up in St. Catharines again. I was offered a senior role at a local um, resort. And, uh, I mean, cultural diversity was at zero at there. So, again, I'm thrust into this, this token situation, you know. Um, so I, I never know how I'm going to be received because I was in a role where I had to be in front of people all the time as a coach, as a director, in this particular affluent environment that which the owner um, had developed. And again, I was very fortunate that I hope because of my character, I was well received, not because of how I look. Right. And, and I hope that carried on and I took that right through, uh, right up until today. So that's a little bit of my story with that, yes. I, I'd be remiss before yeah. I go on to like mm. sharing my experience mm. to ask you, mm -hmm. as someone that attended Brock University yes. then and now I'm sure you've had the privilege yes. and the opportunity to walk through the halls yes, here absolutely. and just to kind of see where the yes. camp is. Yes. And Brock is going to talk to me about some of the differences yeah. just absolutely. optically when absolutely. you're walking by that you absolutely. see. Absolutely. Well, we know that, that Canada immigration now has changed significantly. We know the majority is coming from certain countries. Right. And that's reflective not only in what I do. You know, we host um, competitive tournaments every weekend, and mostly GTA juniors come, under 10, under 12, under 14, under 16, under 18, very, very high performance based juniors. And, and we see what the component of that is. Right. And, we, and it's all the new Canadian. You know, and they're wonderful people. They're educated, they're affluent, they're great athletes and the whole thing. So when I come to Brock and I see that, and, and I have to, I have to pause, that means I have to pause and say, okay, Okay, you know, how, I have to think about that, you know, and uh, to be truthful, the depth of that I haven't really absorbed yet. I, I, and I'm glad I'm here because when, when the invitation came, I said, okay, let, let's get to it, yeah. you know, and, and so we're going to talk more <laughs> yeah. at another time and, 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 and feel that. But uh, to answer you directly, um, being part of a majority and part of a minority is a whole different thing now. And, and, and thanks for the question, yeah. I have, home, I have a lot of homework to do with that. I like to sit back and reflect. It's, a, it's one of the things that even as a young kid, I just used to always have my own thoughts. I remember we'd go to church and my mom would come back and be like, I can tell you're thinking. And I would just be telling her, tell, I'm just reflecting on just the things that I've observed as a kid and just what's going on and how adults interact anyways. So for me, as I hear you speak, a lot of times you're gonna see that I'm gonna have some follow-up questions just Good. because I wanna, I wanna, I wanna know. I, I, I don't have the luxury of having the experience that you have. And I have to say, for someone who's going to turn 68 years yeah. old this year, you look, I hope to look as good as you Thank do. You. You. I might have to change professions <laughs> in the process in order to achieve yeah, that, no. but, um, that's okay. but that's fair. But to get back to the, just the question that was asked in terms of just uh, growing up and some of the challenges, for me, the, I didn't face as much racial challenges. It was more uh, financial challenges growing up, which if you understand how a country runs systematically and some of the issues that uh, people of color have faced, it kind of also becomes a racial issue, for lack of a better word. But growing up in Ottawa, Ottawa was at a stage where it was in a transitional phase where there was starting to be more, like you said, immigration was on the rise. I wouldn't say segregation would, would be the right word, but you had pockets where you knew there would be this ethnicity that lives here, this group lives here, whatever the case may be. So when I fell in love with basketball, I was just playing basketball. And if it wasn't for going to the high school that I went to, um, I don't know if I'd be here today because one of my fellow high school teammates was the one that introduced me to club basketball. I didn't know that that was a thing. I just thought you go to high school, you play with your friends at home um, in, in your neighborhood and you go to high school, you make your high school team, and then you guys have a few regular season games, and that's what it is. But he was the one that actually invited me out. Um, and I was fortunate that I had people like him that helped support me, uh, because his parents essentially covered my first year of club basketball. Because again, imagine 
Um, like I said, my dad got sick pretty early on, so my mom, I didn't speak about her role, but my mom had to leave being a homemaker to go back to school to become a nurse, and now she's taking care of four kids and a sick husband, taking him to dialysis appointments, whatever the case may be. Um, so to drop on her, hey, I want to play club basketball and this is going to be the cost was, truth be told, not even something that I even ever asked her. I, when, I, when I started playing, I figured out a way for it to get covered for me before I even introduced the idea to her because I didn't want to add that burden onto her, her plate. So for me, those were, that was probably the biggest challenge that I faced. Um, and from that point on, I kind of hit the floor running. And, and, but I think that's also why I took full ownership of my basketball endeavors and career because I understood that I was lucky that I had people that were supporting me and I didn't want to make them feel like they were wasting their resources on some on a kid that really isn't theirs and they have no responsibility to so I want to definitely make them proud and and Good for you. and do it in that fashion so that that's that was always for something that resonated to me like people are somehow coming out of pocket for you and they don't owe you anything you better make the most out of this so I, I think as, as a coach the simple answer is this I think that you're you have to be aware of, of, of who you are and, and, and perhaps what you look like if you wish you, you have to be that way even even in even in Ontario Niagara and, and Canada you have to be aware of that and to not and to, to be not conscious of that, is, you're foolish, okay? So that's who you are. Having said that, you know, the character and who you are and how you present that comes from within it. There's no color to that. There's no color to that, you know? You have to be, you have to have the character and make it happen. I get this from my parents. And, and, and as Willie had said, it, it, you know, it's, it's not this. It's who you are. And so that's how I answer that uh, specifically. It's uh, I'm bringing to them uh, the character of who I am, and I'm putting aside the ethnicity that, that there may be good things because of that. There may be challenges because of that. Some of my friends are of the majority, you know, and, and some of the, the challenge uh, of my uh, generation and, and some of the things, and when I show up, a couple of our friends are, of the, of, are not the majority. And so we have sometimes heated, but, 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 positive conversations about this. So now this is, this is my generation. And some of the concerns is, did you get things because of who you are? Right. And, and, and that's, a, that's a question that I don't, I don't, do it, I don't take that very well. You know, because everything that I got, in my opinion, was earned. Right. You know, and I was taught to, for it to be that way, it was earned. Not because of otherwise. So my generation of the 60s and 70s perhaps can say that. The new generation, sometimes you get things because of quotas and so forth. And I can't speak of that. And I, and I don't want to speak of that in this, this forum, but because this is about us, right. you know. So I, that's how I would address that in yourself, yeah. That is, it's, it's, it's a tough question. And, and it's a tough question because life as an athlete and life as a coach mm -hmm. are two completely different things. And I say this because as an athlete, I find you have the luxury, and again, we spoke about it off camera briefly, but you have the luxury as an athlete to be more selfish and to think about yourself at all times. And when you transition into a coach, all of a sudden it has nothing to do with you, but it's about the promotion of others and helping them grow, understand the world, understand the sport, and understand things. I, I think that one thing that I absolutely agree with you is my life change. I, again, this is about us today, but my life could have gone in this direction or this one. And my life changed when I really became self-aware in terms of who I was, but more importantly, who, how I was perceived by others while also never losing track that who I am is who I am and I'm not here to be perceived or to sell myself as something that I'm not for the benefit of others. And that is, that sounds simplistic, but that is also a very complex thing to understand. So for example, one example that I have as a basketball coach is the day that I figured out that I really wanted to take coaching seriously, there's a lot of things in my lifestyle that I had to change. 
I like tattoos, for example. I stopped getting tattoos because I knew that one point in time, I may have to sit in front of a family of a different ethnicity and try to convey to them why they should entrust their kid into my care for the next four to five years to help them continue the job that they've started for these last 18 years and that I would take their kid on to the next chapter of their lives. I did not want to be judged or I didn't want my abilities to be judged based off someone's presumption because of for lack of a better word, art on my body. So again, that's just a small example where life as an athlete, you don't have to think twice. You're an athlete, you can do whatever you want with your body. But if you want to coach and you want to be able to present yourself in a certain light as a businessman, as a, as a coach, as a role model, there are certain things that naturally you have to understand that society judges you for, especially when you walk in and whether people like it or not, as a black man in a room, those are things that you have to put into consideration. So I think for me, so those are, are some of the biggest, not, I wouldn't say challenges, but facts that I had to be very aware of as I transitioned into this now life of mine. And the same way I've had to be very aware leaving the nation's capital and coming into Niagara, which has a completely different uh, population, demographic, demographic, that's the right word, demographic than what Ottawa would have in terms of demographic. I I think, again, I think that sometimes, you know, it's it's out there uh, as a black man, as you say, and, and we have to be sensitive because this is the world that we live in and we are being judged sometimes with that and it might, sometimes it has nothing to do with ethnicity. It's just the fact that the position that we have when, when we put our coaching hat on and, and uh, the families, because in tennis we deal with families and families and families, not only the athlete, it's selling to the family more, <laughs> more than the athlete. And, and perception is, is there. You have to be aware of that and, and that's how I would address that. And, and I'll finish this in like and now as a, as a coach, my athletes, I spend a lot of time trying to get them to understand that vantage point that yes, you're young right now and you're careless, but at some point you're going to realize that some of the decisions you made here can impact what you want and the opportunities that are afforded to you down the line and you have to be very careful on the decisions you make and be, like I said, aware of what life is. I think we want to make change. I want to be someone that makes change. But to make change, you have to understand the landscape and the reality of the current world and not harm yourself and prevent yourself from being in a position to make the change. If that comes from your own personal philosophy, right? And I'm not an out there guy, obviously, as I've been saying. So I, I, I'm expecting a little bit of humility from, from my players. It would be one thing. You know, I, I'm expecting a lot of hard and focused work. Um, I hope that they can find the role model in the tennis world that they can go with. And, and you know, in my generation, we had a gentleman named John McEnroe, who was an incredibly um, successful American um, player, but had the attitude that was very, very, very disrespectful. He would be yelling at referees and this and everything. and and. And in modern days, there's a gentleman, an Aussie, named um, um, Kiryas, who's, who's mimicked that same very just, oh, yes. just awful, um, awful behavior on court. And interestingly enough, both of them have become incredible ambassadors to our sport. You know, th- we know them because of their fame and their ability, but because of their a- original attitude. But now their attitude has completely changed. So change can happen. Change can happen from that. So I expect for my athletes to be to be punctual. I expect them to be focused. I expect them. I don't expect them to think I'm a god, and think that I, I know it all. I'd like to present in a manner that gives them an opportunity to to think for themselves. I don't agree with this, 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 and this. You need create in my sport. We need creativity. And when things aren't going well, you need to be able to think from within. So I'd like to think how I present myself as a coach. It gives them that opportunity to think for themselves and figure it out. Traditionally in my sport, coaches aren't allowed to sit beside the, um, the player. 
you know, although that's starting to evolve a bit. Uh, in university, when I coached at the OUA level, we were able to do that, and we had a couple of interesting stories about that earlier. We may or may not bring that up later on. But anyway, uh, so the player has to be out there and figure it out himself. So if you coach in a manner where they're totally dependent on you, heaven help that player when they go out into the real world, and of course the world of tennis, you know, uh, our sport and competition. So that, those are some of my focuses as, as a coach to, to athlete. The, when I hear your question, the first thought that came to mind was an additional question, which is you say the word development, and that's such a strong and powerful word that for me I would need to know in what aspect. Am I developing them as athletes? Is that the, what the conversation is about? Is it about people? Is it about academics? What There are so many hats and so many development ways in which I have to cater or care for an athlete. So when you're asking that question, I would want to know more specifically. If we're speaking about athleticism, mm -hmm. it's easy for me. I, my job is to help you maximize your potential but I would approach that same philosophy in any development phase that I'm associated with anybody, whatever that development is. If it is your character and who you are as a person, my goal as a coach is to have you overachieve based off who you are naturally in this moment and for you to grow and to maximize your potential as a human being. If it's for you and your academics, is who are you when I inherit you as a student and who do you leave when you leave these doors as an academic in university? And I have a philosophy and it's a philosophy that I've stolen from a previous coach. My biggest thing is I want to challenge my players in their pride in their intelligence, pride in their toughness and pride in their character. And I have very specific definitions of those things or examples when I convey that to them in their development. If you take pride in your character, when your mom and dad or AKA your coach in this instant who kind of serves as your dad, your, yeah. <laughs> all the hats that we face, when I'm not in the room, can I trust you to do the things that A, you said you would do and carry yourself in the same way that you would in front of me in public? Or do you become a completely different person? Because in order to have success and to develop in life, you have to be someone of character. You've used the word yourself in this conversation multiple times, right? The next thing is having pride in your intelligence. Any athlete who wants to develop, or any human being who wants to develop, in my opinion, is someone that in any setting takes pride in their intelligence and wants to grow that intelligence. I always say to people, I'm not the smartest person on earth at all. I don't pretend to be, but I'm intelligent. When I walk in a room, I have the ability to listen, to gather information, to leave the room, think about the information that was provided to me, come up with my own thoughts and perspective of it, be able to come back to someone, share those perspective, to have a back dialogue so that I can come up with my own consensus of the information that I was received. And if you do that every day, whether it's in your sport, in the classroom, in your day-to-day -day life, you're going to learn things in life that you will carry with yourself forever. Right. And then the last piece, and as we, we can talk about it, and as we do this for Black History Month, mm -hmm you have to have toughness and you have to have pride in, in toughness like life as we know it for anybody of any ethnicities will come with challenges whether that's health financial obstacles in your workplace things that happen on a day to day you woke up today and there was a car accident you got an offender bender it throws off your day a lot of people it could throw off their week in a month if you don't take pride in your ability to overcome to overcome to look at challenges as an opportunity for you to grow and to overcome those challenges then how do you develop and how do you move forward in life? Because the second something hinters or gets in the way or you get an obstacle and you go backwards, well, development is to strive to go forward. So for me, when I think of development, whether it's athletics, academics, and individuals, that's the perspective and the lens that I put on and I challenge my athletes to develop in. And again, now we can just divide what part of development we're talking about. But I think it, it, it it's a, a lens that can be put on on any development sphere, for lack of a better term. Again, I'm in an individual sport, okay? And, and I've been lucky to have a variety of successful players, all the way up to Davis Cup, and, and to some who hate me, you know what I mean? And, and so I've had that range. And so I think back, okay, what did I do well with him or her? What did I, what did I, what did I, how did I blow it with these particular people there? So obviously athleticism 
you know, is a quick one to see. I just need to see them do a couple of things very quickly and I can see the athleticism. I think yeah. in, in our world, mm -hmm. and I don't want to say especially in my world, but in team sport because there's such a big chemistry piece that goes into that, it is the hardest thing to do. I think the easy part of it is going into any gymnasium and seeing somebody that moves well, that has athletic capacities, but there are so many nuances to the game of basketball that you're trying to also see somebody's ability to receive information and to react and continue to play the game, the ups and downs of the flow. So when you talk about kind of just like that emotional or that capacity, I think it's a big piece of it. And you, the most important thing is just finding human beings that are never content, in my opinion, and want to be pushed and want, want to be taught. And I always talk to my group about you have to have a thirst for knowledge. And the people that have a thirst for knowledge are often the ones that succeed in sports because they're constantly continuously on a path of improvement. So when you're going through the recruiting process, you want to find, for me, individuals. And, and again, I'm learning through this. Like I said, I'm in my fifth year as a head coach, and I've been coaching now for nine years. Um, so I understand very much so that I'm but a puppy in the coaching world, and I hope that my career goes on forever, but as I'm going through the recruitment process year after year, I'm starting to understand that I just want to find athletes that want to speak the language, that want to talk basketball, that want to be pushed, that look at life in a certain lens. So for me, the conversations have become more important than your actual abilities. Because I can speak for myself, I had no business being a professional basketball player. But every day that I showed up, I could regurgitate what my coach had said yesterday. I could put myself back in a setting because it mattered to me. So you look for athletes that want to be pushed, that want to have a thirst for knowledge, and that care. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't care and it doesn't mean as much to you as it does to somebody else, they will, over, they will always overcome whatever disadvantage they have in comparison to the person that is the most talented. How do you create the, you know, the team, the team, the team element of it? Well, because that's so critical with these. I think it's in the recruitment. If you recruit like-minded individuals, yeah. they often will connect and push each other and that's where you create a culture of knowledge, hard work, care, passion. And when you don't and you have people that don't fit into that culture, they oftentimes stick out like a sore thumb. Or if you do a really bad job as a coach, which coaches can al allude to this, and they go for the talent or what the sh that shining bright object, oftentimes it's not the players that stick out like a sore, th a sore thumb. Now you, the coach sticks coach, out like yeah. a sore thumb because you don't embody the team that you've created, nor does the team embody who brought them in. I remember one time I was in um, I was in Turkey, and our national team. This was wheelchair when I was in the wheelchair program. Um, we were in Turkey at a, at a uh, it's called World Team Cup. So all the best countries in the world come, and it's a team event. Yeah. Okay, even though it's singles and double, but it's a team event. And I remember our our top player, a gal who was one of the number one in the world for for many years uh, as an athlete and and as as a chair player, and and uh, we went out in the court. And I'm going, and I don't know her. She's from Vancouver. I'm from, from Ontario. Uh, we had a few camps and so forth. So I got to know her a little bit. This is an adult woman. And I went out there, and she was a type that I just let her do her thing, you know. So I just let her do her thing. And then partway through, her thing, in my opinion, wasn't the right thing to do. So as coaches, we think we're smart, and we should we just want to jump in. So, okay, so in my mind, now, this is not working with juniors. This is working with adults now who, who was on circuits and so forth. I said, I'm sitting there in the chair. It's about 100 degrees out in Turkey on a clay court. I'm going, should I say something here? Uh, the instance was she was double faulting all the time. And she was doing a, a skill that she couldn't do anymore. It was past her time. Right. But in her mind, and it was an important event, I've got to do this. And it was very low percentage and inappropriate. I didn't say anything. I let it go. 
So interestingly, you fast forward two weeks later, I get this little email from the director of Tennis Canada saying, you know, I think they wished you would said more. <laughs> I went, okay. I guess I blew that one. It's a tough balance. It's just half the time as a coach, you realize you fail. Yeah. And, and it's, I, we just had a game on Saturday and one of the refs came to me because they had made a decision against our team um, a couple weeks back and he came and apologized and I said you don't have to apologize I said we are five minutes into this game and I think I've already made 20 mistakes so mistakes are gonna happen let's just move forward it's just it, it's such a fine balance but I think the, the number one thing for me in recruitment is that I've gone over myself and realize I can't fix them all. And I think sometimes as coaches, you get in this position, and I don't know if you've heard this before, but we get almost like this God complex that we're so good at our craft that we can take anybody with any talent, regardless of some of the baggage that comes with that individual, some of the, um, some of the things that they just don't have the ability to, to that are clear red flags. Yeah. And we go, we're good enough to fix that. I have since realized I don't have the ability to fix people and undo the work of 18 years and inherit a new kid and now turn this child into something different. Snap the finger doesn't it, work that it way. Does it does not. Doesn't unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And I think that has been one of my biggest lessons in recruitment in the early set onset of my career. Yeah, well, I, I think I'm dependable. You know, I think that's important as, as a person. Uh, my wife might challenge that, but <laughs> I'd like to think in terms of pick up and drop off. But anyway, the, uh, I think I'm dependable in terms of that. I'd like to think I do my homework when, when it comes to a particular environment, you know, and I think I'm quite focused when I'm, when I'm, when I'm on task with something. I'm quite focused on it, and I try to make it, try to make it work. Yeah, I, I would describe myself in similar light. I would say, I would say I'm honest. I think my athletes and anyone in my life knows that if they come to me with a question that they are prepared to get the truth and sometimes people like that and sometimes people don't but at least they know that they're gonna get it and um, I like to say that I'm I'm prepared I, I do a lot of work to be prepared I I have gotten here to where I am. I was, when I was hired here, I was the youngest coach in the country, and I think you get to that point because you're prepared and you know your craft. And I think that I care. I think I care about the things I care about, and the things that I don't care about, I have no, no problem telling people I don't care and don't expect me to care. And I think, again, that's part of the honesty piece. But the things that I care about, when I care about people that I bring into my program, my family, my friends, my job, my work, I care, I care to a fault almost, where I can't separate at the times. And I think for me, that's almost a, the good and the bad that comes with it. I think the way I've been able to maintain it is by not caring to maintain it, ironically, I am who I am and I think we spoke about that earlier, it's just I'm aware that I'm the only black coach but I don't walk around with a chip on my shoulder because I'm the only black coach. If anything, I want to make sure that I'm not doing that so that I can open myself up for my counterparts to feel like there's a place where there's no judgment when they come to me about any issues re regarding race or basketball or whatever it is that I can come to this because he's going to be human. Yeah. There's going to be a humanistic approach and understanding to Willie when I speak to him. So for me, I don't walk around trying to prove my identity to anybody. I think I've only gone in here. My mom used to call me as when I was younger in, in Creole. There's a, a phrase called mafoube which means you don't care about anything. And it was almost my strength because I'm not preoccupied with trying to prove to somebody that my existence is worthy of being in the room or that I've, I just, I am who I am, I'm self-aware, I know my strength, I know my weaknesses, I know who I want to be, I know my heart, I know the things that I want to convey to the world, and I know my mission. And therefore, when you are in line with who you are and you're confident in those things, you 
you can just be who you are and it's one of the biggest messages that I have for my athletes is when you leave this university I want you to have real confidence because when you're at the stage of their their lives when they're in university and their undergrad from 18 to 24 that is for me for lack of a better word for them it's like a renaissance era who am I where am I going where do I want to be who do I want to become and my job as a coach is to be able to have men that leave my program and have real confidence real identity in who they are so that I can be sure that no matter what happens they're gonna be just fine I don't have to be I don't have to worry about you you wonder if that's being too much to one side you know should we should we be in that face and this is who we are and so forth that I wrestle a little bit with that and 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 perhaps to a fault as well even though this is Willie's question but I, I, I kind of wonder that's another day perhaps maybe you'll invite us back next year and we'll have an answer to that but, but you're right yeah. there there is there is that fight and that dilemma and that that should butting of the head fight. should I be more yeah. Yeah. aggressive yeah. about who I am and some of the beliefs that I have um, and again, maybe a conversation for another I day. Take another time. Yeah. yeah, I take my 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 profession and and who I am very seriously. Okay, and the basis of that is the truth, you know, honesty, and and factual. So it, should that person will have said I, the story I told of football where where I was criticized by an opponent, um, they weren't right. They weren't right, and I'll give them the reasons why they're not right. And I have to give them, it can't be based on what we look like. It can't be based on that. It has to be based on, on, on fact. So if they come at me and they're completely correct in everything, I have to admit to that. And I will admit to that and say, okay, I'll learn from that and I'll, I'll go a different direction. But if they're not right, I'll come at them. You know, I say, well, you know, here we go and, and let's go at it. But I'm coming at you with the right, the, where it should be and how it is. Yeah, I, I think I'd have to agree. Uh, I think <laughs> oftentimes, and I say this, please, whoever's watching, mm -hmm. don't judge me, and I may regret saying this, but mm -hmm. oftentimes we're sensitive to what we perceive to be aggressions because we don't have the ability and the knowledge to communicate our thoughts and what we mean or what we are trying to convey and I think again I go back to my athletes as a coach it's why I always want them to understand the importance of knowledge and information to be well educated to be very to learn how to communicate I think a lot of frustrations come from a lack of communication and I think back about my life too when I said to you guys earlier the best thing that ever happened to me is when I actually start to understand being aware and self-awareness and from that moment on some of the frustrations that I would have had growing up that would have been felt as micro or macro aggressions towards me did not feel as such because I had the ability to speak and to convey my thoughts and I think that yes do micro and micro and macro aggressions happen in the workplace or in the world yes but I think that you can arm yourself with the ability to speak and to convey your thoughts and that can oftentimes settle any situation and turn a an aggression into a conversation and if a conversation can occur then perspective can be drawn I, I, again I I don't feel that the opportunity should be provided just because of who you are and whether it's black or, or, or anything however our mosaic of, of the Canadian, because um, we're speaking uh, of Canada, we're speaking of Ontario, we're speaking perhaps of Southern Ontario specifically here. Uh, it's a very unique environment um, and, and we look at commercials and we see the, the, you know, it's all there and so forth. So again, if I can jump to my environment, tennis, we're fortunate in Canada that we have, we're well represented with all the ethnicities from the males to the women you know, from the men to the women. And so, not because of purpose, just because they happen to be the athletes who were available and who have really stepped it up in that time. 
So the best thing that we can do, I think, is to recognize that this is who we are, and I think it will happen. I'm naive enough to say that I think it will happen, simply because of the makeup of, 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 of the world that, that I live in. You know, I think it will happen. I, I don't think all of a sudden one particular uh, demographic will all of a sudden take over. You know, I, I think it will happen. And, and is that a Canadian way of thinking, perhaps? It may be naive, I, I don't know. You know, and again, that's another conversation. And if you invite us back, that, that we'll have that. But in thinking of, of some of the questions I thought that, that might come, uh, I wanted to be very clear that, you know, Canada and Ontario is in a good way. And, and a lot of the people who put effort into doing things, it, it is spread out. And we don't have as much uh, as perhaps some media would like to, you know, say. And, and, but I, I need to be more educated myself, coming from my generation, to see, you know, is this the truth? So that's from my generation, yeah. Uh, I, I, and from where my vantage point, and I'll, I can only speak about the sport of basketball because that's what I ultimately know and I can make assumptions about others, but I like to speak in truth and in fact. I think in order f for, and again, it's not even just about providing more opportunities for black coaches. I think just in general, we live in an era where p a lot of people think that they can become overnight successes and become coaches because they either played the game and can just tell people how to run, where to run, what to do. There's so much more that goes into coaching and without having a real mentor, how can you ever really understand the depth of coaching? Think about your simple question about what is development? Well, now go ask that to a majority of the coaches that aren't in some of these chairs and ask them to answer that question. Would they have ever had thought about what their approach is, what their lens? That's coaching. And it's more than just a sport. And to be a coach, you're almost becoming a life coach. Well, to be a life coach, you have to live a certain life. And how do you inspire others to live a not righteous life, but a certain life if you don't have yourself a mentor to help you navigate life? So for me, I think that's the biggest piece. And I hope that in my career, as time goes on, I can become a mentor to more that understand that. But just like anything else, and I think we've said this in conversation, if you don't have a thirst for knowledge, you can never find a mentor because you're not seeking mentorship you know it, it, it's we've I've grown up with it you know again I've you've heard me say I've come from a country that 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 um, that was a very important part but it wasn't considered that because this was life these were who the people were you know when you come to this wonderful country of Canada uh, and in the 60s and 70s it was slowly evolving and and so in, in, in that time, in my world, and again, like you're saying, I, I want to speak here of what, what my world will is not what I think of it. And it was slowly evolving. So we were on the forefront of, of being that person, perhaps who's in the back, who's now in the front, you know, because of who they are in terms of what they can do, not because of how we look, because of who they are. In my case, it was sport. In others, it might have been whatever you know, um, academics, uh, my son's a wonderful dancer. So he's in the forefront because of his dance skills, not because of his ex, <laughs> you know. And, and so that's how I would, I would go into that. So my generation was in the forefront of saying, There's an, who are we, who are these people? Are they really truly that different? You know, and, and maybe they are different and maybe they're not, but I'd like to think and to a certain extent, we are who we are because we've developed those things, and hopefully we're represented because of that. And, and that's the direction I would go with that. I like honesty, so I'm going to have a very honest answer, and it's an answer that doesn't paint me in the greatest light, but it's also the answer that has changed my approach when it comes to Black History Month and just being a black man and a black coach and a black father and all the things that come with that is... Until the pandemic, I don't know if I would, ad I would admit that it's not something that I really cared about. I understood Black History Month. I knew about black history, 
all of the oppression that we faced, everything that comes with being a black man. But it wasn't until I watched the events of um, George Floyd and we're all sitting at home with nowhere to go and you're seeing this and it's the impact that it, I remember feeling. I remember where I was, where I was sitting when I first saw that video. And just even thinking about it, just it takes me back to that place. And I had just finished my first year as a head coach here at Brock at the time, which is crazy enough that that was already four years ago. And I remember sitting there and saying, after your rookie year as a head coach, is, is this all there is to coaching? Or is, is this an opportunity to use your voice, your platform, or even having a room that oftentimes has more black men than other cultures uh, just by the nature of the sport that you're educating, that you're developing? Um, what do you want to do with that platform and how will you maximize that platform to do more than just tell people how to bounce a basketball. So f over the course of the last four years, I've gotten myself a lot more involved in these areas and these topics. So now for me, Black History Month serves as an opportunity for conversation. And I love conversation. I love to spearhead conversation. I love to spearhead, con not controversy, but emotion so that you can get a the truth and a conversation out of people. And that's what this month has now become. It's an opportunity for me to help spearhead conversations that make others, including us as black people, more aware of our surroundings and the, the landscape of the world and to educate our counterparts. Because at the end of the day, like I keep saying in this conversation, education is just, for me, the importance and what gives someone the confidence to be who they are. And I think some of our counterparts just don't have the confidence to speak on our behalf because we haven't provided them a space to have conversation and an education. Yeah. I think we're lucky that um, because of some of the things that we do, um, we, we're, again, we're a little bit in the forefront there. So that's important for us to, 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 to use that as a catalyst, use that as a, as a platform right. to have the conversation. Uh, the question becomes, what is the conversation specifically? Exactly. You know, but, uh, but for me, that's the starting point for me is that I'm lucky enough to be, I don't know if it's lucky, but we get invited to things such as this because of, of, of whatever, yeah. you know, and that gives me a platform to be able to speak on, on topic. I don't like um, movie stars who start, who are politicians and all, you know, you're not expert when I can, I will only speak on the things I know, uh, things I know yeah. you know what I mean? And, and so that's the platform that I would go on. So that's how it is to me. I, 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 I've laughed as a coach. Um, I have, I'm lucky enough, and at the time I didn't think I was lucky, but when I met my partner after my first year here, uh, she is from Oakville and I was living here in, in St. Catharines. And because of where she works and I work, we've kind of moved to Hamilton, Stony Creek area. So I have the we won't hold that against you. Yeah, no, it's fine. But I, I've, I now consider it the biggest advantage in my life because every time I leave my job, I get a buffer where I get to just cleanse my thoughts and figure out uh, before I walk through the door what kind of parent, partner I want to be. Um, and I say this to say, coaching, you meet so many different athletes and individuals and you're trying to help them navigate and develop to overachieve. So on your way home, you deal with these things and then you get to go on your drive home and I get to think about what I want for my kids and what I need to do as a parent to make sure that I'm raising them to overcome some of the challenges that I see my athletes have faced and that have gotten in the way of their ability to maximize their potential. So for me, when I think about raising my kids, I have almost a cheat code of seeing others and the failures of others to be able to make sure that mine don't have the same failures. Now, I mean, I didn't get married till I was in my early 40s, so I, I did a lot of between Brock and, and, and that time. And, and, and I was lucky enough, that I met my, actually, I met my wife first year here, actually, coincidentally. She also played tennis. And although we didn't get together till many years after. And um, 
so family is certainly the glue. Uh, it's, a, it's a cliche, but it's very important. Uh, she's such a smart lady. I don't know why she puts up with me, but but boy, you know, it, it gave a different it gave a different perspective. It, it brings wisdom and so forth, and, and I'm very fortunate to have met her. Um, uh, we adopted two lovely um, twins when I was 45 uh, from Toronto. And, and we, I remember distinctly going to this. Uh, my wife said, don't you think we should, um, this is a, I was in my mid-40s at the time, and my, I, don't know she'll, I don't know if she'll put up with my conversation here, but anyway, she's having breakfast uh, down in St. Catharines, so it's okay. But, um, you know, she said, I think it's time to have family, you know. And here we are in our 40s, so that's a, that's a different path. So let's, let's try adoption. And I said, okay, all right. And, and, and she's a teacher as well. And so we've been with children all the way through as a coach and educators and so forth. So I said, okay, we'll go to this, this fair in Toronto. Okay, and we went to this almost like a convention and they had all these children in need there. And, and, and we walked into this room and they were these two three-year-old twins, James and Lorreen. And we said, yes. You know, and we met them like a month later and they became the St. Catharines not even six months after that. And they're 24 right now. And, and they're lovely people. And do they listen to what I say? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, and like my wife, absolutely not. But I think that my actions will influence, you know, who they are. And, and fortunately, my daughter takes after um, uh, my wife, and, and she's a very stubborn young lady and, and really wonderful, but I, I, my wife won't agree, Lori won't agree with this, but I, I think she takes after her and has that stubbornness and that tenacity like which I thought my mother had as well, because we speak about our mothers. And, and I take after my father, so I tend to be in the background, need to be kicked ever so often, but um, Maybe my son does a little bit of that, perhaps. But very important, and, and, the, and the short answer is, family is very important. If you're fortunate to have it, put energy into it, because it, it will not stay. You have to put energy into that. And I, I'd like to think I've done that over the last X number of decades. Thank you. I would say my greatest accomplishment, and now that I have my own kids, it's going to change, but my greatest accomplishment has been the success of my younger brother. Um, and I say that to say I came from a very religious background. My mom's a Seventh-day Adventist, which means that we observe the Sabbath on Friday night. Everything shuts down until the sun falls again on Saturday. And I had to be the black sheep of my family in order to convince her to let me play the sports, which opened up the door for my younger brother to uh, play. And my brother got a chance to play Division One basketball at Creighton University. Um, and also leave home at 16, 17 years old to go to a prep school. He's now in his 10th year playing professionally and I just, for me, as a, we talk about family, my siblings are my best friends, they're my everything, um, they're my backbone. And to have him live the life that he's lived and is currently living is, for me, my biggest accomplishment. Uh, I, I think that that when my parents came over, as I've said earlier, from, from, from a country which they did very well in. It was, a, it was a lovely country through there up until that, you know, till the mid-60s. Um, their goal was to come to Canada to make a difference for not only themselves but their children. And I'd like to think of my brother who's older and myself have done that. You know, we, we, we went to school, um, uh, we got educated, <laughs> uh, we were able to have some interesting activities. Um, I took up tennis, you know, dad doesn't need to hear any more of those stories, but anyway, I took up tennis and um, found a great university, Brock, and, and went on to have life and family. So I think that's the balance of, of living the dream I think my parents would be very happy with. And I think that's my, my give back to them that I, uh, my dad always says, when are you going to get a real job? But I don't know. I don't know. Mom understands it. So uh, uh, bless his soul. But um, so that's the biggest accomplishment, to find balance, to contribute to a Canadian way. Uh, I've, been, I've been so lucky to, to be part of a sport where I can give back and, and seen tremendous success within that. But really, it's the whole picture that, 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 that makes it work. I, I, and again, I, I think my biggest accomplishments in life have nothing to do with me. And I think 
I'm very blessed to be able to say that because a lot of people are so focused on them all the time, me, 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 where for me I get to l live my successes through the success of other people that I've helped. Right, so I think that's that's a huge blessing, and it kind of helps you have perspective and not to take yourself so seriously. And if if I can say to close that, uh, you know, being here and and being invited and, and to speak with Willie and yourselves and, and and the crew, one of the questions that you asked is, what does the Black History Month mean to myself? And this, and I'll echo what what you say. It's it's growing in that consciousness of that, you know, because I'm not a youngster anymore, so we're living it. You know, we're really living it. And, and if I think back, you know, we're doing things that, that are very positive within who we are. And we have to step up for that. And, and maybe moving forward, this is a conversation off camera perhaps, you know, we have to use our platform to be out there a little bit more. It's my basic nature, perhaps, to be in the background, as I've said earlier. And, and so this type of thing I find is a little tricky. Um, but I have to really, I have to, re, I have to rethink that, if, if I may, and say, okay, you know, let's, let's use our platform and, and let's present it I, and I'm, go from there. I'm very similar to you. I I'm, mm -hmm. I'm don't like the spotlight. Mm -hmm. I don't like the attention. Mm -hmm. um, but I keep asking myself if I'm going to one day wake up and regret the fact that I didn't take advantage of this platform this opportunity to do more and to help more and i think like we've been talking about mm. when you are constantly thinking about ways to improve not only yourself but yeah. the world around you um you're always in reflection and like i said the black history for my months for me is just a time of reflection okay. and how to affect change outside of the month nice to meet you pleasure take care